Uh, Jamie Lee is the manager of climate change and sustainability services at EY. And uh, she joins us at the podium. Uh, Jamie works with global executive leaders to develop sustainability management and reporting strategies and is currently project managing the establishment of international business co of of International Business Coalition focusing on plastic waste pro products. I'm going to let you take it from there because it's a subject that we've all been waiting to hear about. And again, thank you for being flexible. Of course. Thank you, Clara, and obviously the Better Business Bureau for inviting me to speak today. I really do feel lucky to be working on this important issue, uh, both from a personal and professional perspective. As you can probably tell from my accent, I like to say I come from the deep, deep, deep south, also known as Australia where for us, the ocean really is part of our national identity. We're surrounded by it on all sides, and many of my fondest memories as a kid are long days spent at the beach, snorkeling with my folks at the Barrier Reef, and it was a much different memory I had going back to the reef to do my diving license 20 years later. So as an ocean appreciator and user, I've got a vested interest in the ocean's health, as I imagine many of you do as well. Um, but as Claire said, from a prof professional perspective, the last 18 months have almost been the most rewarding of my career. Um, having been part of the founding team for the Alliance to End Plastic Waste uh, was truly a privilege. It's been quite a journey from five people in a room going, should we even do this, to a real pinch yourself moment I had last month when we now had 80 representatives from across the entire plastics value chain coming together in a room to work on solutions as allies and not competitors. So before we could even do all of that though, there was really a, a big piece of research that needed to be done to understand what is the plastic waste challenge and what are its drivers and what should the Alliance do around that? So I'm excited to share with you today some of the outcomes of those findings or the findings of that research um, and certainly touch on also what's happening in terms of actions, how are businesses and consumers responding? But first, the fun, we are an audit firm, legal disclaimer. Uh, my words are my own, they may not represent they may, they may not necessarily represent EY and please take this for educational speech and not advice, even in the Q&As if you try and sneak any in. Okay, so uh, it's always fun to start with some alarming statistics just to set the mood. Um, but what we're talking about is plastics and plastics really represents a broad range of polymers which are traditionally made from petrochemical products. They're lightweight, they're low cost, and they're impervious to water, which makes them really useful. I know that I really struggle to imagine what my day-to-day -day life would look like if plastics had never been invented. But really, they've only been mass-produced since the 1940s and 50s, so they haven't been around in our modern life for long. But in that time, plastic use over the last 50 years has increased 20-fold. In 2016 alone, the amount of plastic produced for every person on the planet is around 53 kilograms, roughly this much. And that's not slowing down. With increasing population and increasing consumption, over the next 20 years, production is expected to double, which is kind of alarming. Um, and more so, that of all the plastic produced since 1950, about 30% of it is still in use, but 70% of that has already become waste. And as you can see from the graph, around 75% of that has ended up in landfills, 9% has been recycled, or I should say only 9% has ever been recycled, 12% has been incinerated and thereabouts the remaining 4% for those who are eagle calculators um, is expected to have gone to the natural environment. So, unless there is a dramatic change of approach, an additional 104 million metric tons of plastic could enter our ecosystems within the next 10 years. I know it's kind of hard to imagine what 100 million tons looks like, so if you want to take a moment, close your eyes if you must, think of 17 million adult full-grown elephants. But the, plastic, or the issue of plastic waste isn't a local or global issue. It, it's on both fronts. And while there are many more different impacts I could have highlighted here, let's call these the top five. Um, damage to marine life is probably the one I think we feel most intuitively. Uh, we've seen the photos of seals getting stuck in fishermen's nets. We've seen turtles having straws pulled out of their nose. We've seen the carcasses of seabirds and mammals on the shore who have died of starvation with bellies full of plastic. But there are other uh, issues that are also potential uh, issues for human health. We've got air pollution from burning municipal waste. Groundwater contamination is a big issue. From the statistic alone, you can see that microplastics are invading our waterways. And it's not a localized issue. It's all around the globe. All five continents uh, have that problem already. And then there's uh, challenges of bioaccumulation for the food chain. We don't know yet what the risks are to human health of um, microaccumulation in the circulatory and respiratory systems. There was a study last year that actually showed that seals which had ingested mackerel that had ingested microplastics 
have what they call trophic transfer, where those plastics were then absorbed by the seals themselves and retained in their body, which is kind of scary. And then lastly, I mean, there's economic concerns as well. We've highlighted waterways, which do cause clog clogging in floods, but there are significant other costs uh, in terms of tourism, lost dollars on areas that are no longer frequented. There's the cost of actual cleanups themselves, which are very costly and not practical in a lot of senses. Um, and there's also the intangible costs of being unable to enjoy the waterways for recreation um, or perhaps fishing uses as well. And there's a sixth one which I haven't put on here but I'm considering, which is kind of what we spoke to before about human rights and really what is the safety of people in this industry. Particularly in developing countries, there's a big informal sector of waste pickers whose sole job day in day out is to collect plastics, or higher value plastics anyway, out of landfills as dump trucks are actively throwing the waste onto the landfills. It's low pay, it's high risk, and even though there are some unions forming, uh, typically we often see there's child labor invested in that as well, uh, either by choice or because they're there supporting their parents. So plastic waste truly is a wicked problem. Um, and even though I've quoted you those great stats, it really is an area that has incomplete and contradictory knowledge. There's been very few global studies to date that actually categorize plastic waste and its composition and its geographic dispersion. There's been local studies where that waste information is available and certainly some waterway and ocean studies, but huge extrapolations have had to be made to understand this global data. Uh, and it's being refined every year. There was an example of a well-quoted statistic that 90% of the world's plastic waste came from 10 rivers across the world, quoted for the last four years, until this year when a new study came out and said, actually, we think it's closer to 1,000 rivers, which is a much more wicked problem to solve. Uh, and of course, the number of people and divergent opinions. In many ways, plastic is almost an ethical uh, issue and really how you perceive the value of the plastic molecule. On one end of the spectrum, you have some NGOs who say, we should never produce any plastics ever and must take them out of our current usage. There's those who step over who say, well, if we could implement a circular economy, then we could get the value back out of those um, plastic molecules and reuse them. And there's some maybe on the practical end who say, well, at the very least, if we're putting it in a well-lined landfill and it's not leaking to the environment, shouldn't that be our immediate concern to really stop the challenge that we have? And then I, we can't even talk about today the, the challenge of, or the discussion around is, is burning plastic in an incinerator for fuel a better or worse use of that molecule? Uh, so certainly the, there's large economic burden and I think the thing about that is it's also uneven. Uh, all the major, uh, major plastic producers in the world are primarily in North America and Europe, but there's five countries in the world which produce more mismanaged waste than the rest of the world combined. Uh, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and I think it's Laos. That's not quite like that. But who should pay for that? Is it those who use and consume the plastic, or is it those who are profiting off it in the beginning? So that's a, a pretty quick summary of the state of plastics, and I mean, perhaps more positively, positively, let's start looking at the actions. And I do think this is beginning to be a positive story. Certainly, uh, the scale and speed of government interventions is increasing, and it's increasing quickly. A lot of this action really started around 2016, and 2017 was the first UN Oceans Conference. Since then, there's been a, a large plethora of action at the country, state, and local level. Um, in fact, 187 countries have actually regulated plastic bags in one way or another since July 2018. It's definitely more since now. Of these, I think it's interesting to look at the UK, um, the UK is a great one where the David Attenborough Blue Planet series has been pivotal in really um, raising consumer awareness on the issue, but it's also been very effective in driving legislation. So the Queen herself declared a war on plastics after having seen the series, and it really led to some encompassing actions, including this one, is that by 2042 they're going to eliminate all avoidable plastics, and that's broader than single-use plastics. Uh, it does include those, but also um, other packaging materials that we may use quite frequently at the moment. And I think one of the more interesting or, or like, I wouldn't say harsh, but challenging ones is Kenya. Anyone who's caught or participating in the plastic bag value chain in any way, even as a user, can risk a six month imprisonment or a US $40,000 fine. That's probably more deterrent than uh, we've seen in actuality. Uh, but as we said, this is a wicked problem and it has unintended consequences. 
Kenya was actually a major exporter of plastic bags to the entire region, and because of this prohibition, they lost $60,000, 60,000 uh, employees, and 187 factories had to close down because of that. There are consequences to these regulatory actions. On the top right, uh, international treaties and, treaties and trade restrictions. There is definitely a growing movement um, that is trying to put a framework around plastics in a global sense. So can we create a cap and trade which would apply to all countries, um, whether that's in their use or their waste, kind of similar to a Paris Agreement. We're not there yet. Um, there's been some actions around addressing what is the real near-term problem of um, the trade of plastic waste globally. I think it's, it's made the popular news, so many of you might be familiar, but a couple of years ago, China actually put some significant restrictions on the quality of plastic waste that it would import. It would almost ruled out all of their imports. China was processing 50% of the world's plastic at the time, and while a couple of countries in the Southeast Asia picked up the slack for a few years, they too now have significant restrictions, and they're sending barges back to the US and Europe with the waste that they won't touch. So the recycling system is at a global standstill right now. And in the longer term, while that could support investment in domestic infrastructure, right now all of that excess plastic waste is essentially going to landfill. And so domestically, recycling is failing to uh, achieve its full potential as well. 40% of US plastics are single use and have a lifespan of less than one year. There's an estimate that those plastics could take 450 years to biodegrade, but to be honest, we don't know. As we said, plastics have only been in mass production in the last 50 years, and there's a lot of variables dependent on environment, um, whether that's external, in the water, in landfills. It could be a lot longer than that, many more generations. And the US recycling rate is about 9% currently, which is very low, even by global terms. Germany leads the pack on this. They achieve about a 65% plastics recycling rate. But there are other um, Asian countries as well. So Taiwan and South Korea actually achieve 59 and 55% um, recycling rates respectively. So what are we doing different? And as I mentioned before, if the, the Asian bans continue, Dell's predicting that that recycling rate could fall to 2.9%. The data is a few years later, so that's when we'll see it. Um, but that's an alarming statistic to me as well. On the more positive side, if the US was to invest in its infrastructure for recycling and recovery, there are estimates that could add $10 billion to the economy in benefits and create nearly $40,000 40, jobs. So how are companies responding? And again, I think this is a positive news piece. Um, we've highlighted seven different aspects here, but certainly there are many more and uh, too many to cover. So these are, these are to me some of the highlights. Uh, on the front end, we've got, uh, well, I guess there's two approaches to this. Companies can either affect the plastic which they use in their own operations or across the supply chain and the influence that they have. And I think Walmart is a really interesting example where even though they have their own packaging targets around their home brand products, they're exerting influence on their suppliers to actually remove non-recyclable materials such as PVC. It's, they say working with their partners now, but I would not want to be the last supplier that has PVC trying to get into Walmart a few years from now. Uh, and enhancing recyclability of plastic packaging. We spoke a little bit of, about it before today because it's really a hot area. It's almost mind-boggling that a lot of packaging isn't recyclable. Um, but in the last few years, um, major consumer, ban consumer brands, which now represent 20% of the global market, have made these strong commitments that 100% of the recycling of the packaging will be recyclable or reusable. And the UK Plastics Pact is a great example of how you can do this in a local area. In the last year alone, they've signed up 127 members, uh, primarily retailers, uh, but also everyone involved in that value chain, to target it within the UK itself. Again, this 100% recyclability goal. But it's all good having recyclable materials unless someone's actually going to use them. So a strong driver for this is you can create products that incorporate PCR packaging, or on the more challenging end, you can, so PCR is post-consumer resin, so after you've used the bottle, it comes back. Or you can try and incorporate some of that resin into new products as they're going out. Um, Procter & Gamble has made a big commitment to double their post-consumer resin use by 2020. They're not so open on what their baseline is, I think it's in the teens and they're doubling that, but it's a significant company and that's a significant scale. Similarly, Coca-Cola will target 50% of post-consumer resin in all packaging by 2030. That goal is huge. So PCR percentages at the moment are maybe 10% of uh, recycled resin compared to 90% virgin, 
there are example projects that have used 100 percent uh, fully recycled, but those are few and far between. To have Coca-Cola target 50 percent recycled um, resin in all those products, that's quite game changing. Uh, there are alternatives as well. Should we be using bioplastics? Bioplastics, in a sense, are better for the environment as they, instead of using petrochemicals as their feedstock, as we talked about earlier, they utilize other sugars, so sugar cane and corn. But to the wicked problem sense, is it ethical for us to convert the land use of corn and sugar fields to create more plastics when that could be used to feed a growing population? I'll try and power through it in how I can. Um, the concept of, concept of extended producer responsibility is also a growing one. Uh, in Europe, it's, it's legislated, uh, but global companies are trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit and actually develop systems where they can be in control of this supply chain. So Coca-Cola has the largest processing plant in Mexico for pet bottles, uh, and they have a target of recycling 100% of sole packaging by 2030. That's not necessarily a net for net, one in, one out, but by volume of what they put out, they will recycle as well. Uh, but Coca-Cola is an example where even in their Mexico, Mexican landfills, they know they have child labor as a, an issue there. Uh, Unilever is publishing a full palette of materials in their packaging. This transparency helps create secondary markets. If suppliers have a sense of what Unilever is using and where they're going directionally, they can start to build their markets around it. Without this transparency, they're kind of guessing where the ball's gonna go, and that just doesn't give the market um, a room to build. So lastly, I mentioned before, there's cross-value chain initiatives and funding. There is a broad acceptance that no one company or no one industry can tackle this problem alone. It needs cross-value chain solutions. So my work has been in the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, and Closed Loop Ocean is another great, essentially, investment funding vehicle, which is a for-profit exercise. This is not about philanthropy. If we create solutions that are philanthropy-based, they won't be sustainable solutions. So Closed Loop is investing in solutions that will generate a profit or return for those who invest. Uh, and on the bottom end, we have some of the more uh, influential NGOs. So Trash Free Seas Alliance, New Plastics Economy, and Cephlex, they really get the brands and others together to think about this from the front end, think about it from design. What can you share in learnings from each other to produce bottles with less plastics or use different materials or uh, simplify the complexity? So those are great um, knowledge sharing devices as well. So what's on the horizon? This is very much my word. This is the four things that have really excited me over the last year, um, which are really up and coming. Chemical recycling. The technology is not new. Um, basically, any plastic can be melted down with enough heat into its base molecule component. But it's not economical, and it's really hard to do on a commercial scale. So there's a number of pilots around the world which are trialing this on a commercial scale, which could really re-envisage the way that we actually manage plastic waste instead of the old mechanical recycling. Um, and there's even pyrolysis plants which are being developed for each home. So maybe one day each of you would do the plastic recycling right next to your own kitchen sink. Curbside flexible waste. Uh, there's a plant out in Pennsylvania which is a, a recycling and landfill facility which has been family owned for the last four generations. They want to keep uh, managing this landfill, but to do so they have to stop filling it up. So they recognize that they have an opportunity here to actually be the first in the country to trial a system where they can uh, tackle flexible waste. So all the plastic bags that you're asked to keep out of recycling, any of the chip bags and bread bags, if this pilot proves successful, you can include those in your regular recycling stream and they have different optical sorters down the machine line that will both blow that away, so it separates out from the paper and other plastics, but then captures that and creates new products out of that. Typically building materials, building tiles, maybe even plastic roads like they do in India. Uh, but that'll be an entirely new market, at least domestically. Improved cleanup up top, uh, improved cleanup technologies. Not it right. Clean up technologies. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the ocean cleanup, which was a device that's very similar to this, created by a 21-year-old Dutch man who spent years getting the funding and designs together and started trialing it this year. It wasn't completely successful, but they are learning because it's quite difficult to have something that's going to be out in the ocean and exposed to the elements all day, every day. And the volume of plastic waste they captured was more than they ever expected. Um, so I think we're definitely going to see more and more cleanup systems being impl implemented in oceans and rivers. But also there's, uh, there's proposals for big, basically giant vessel systems, which would troll nets, capture that plastic, process it on board, perhaps using pyrolysis that we're talking about, and then take that product to the nearest port, or whichever port is the highest bidder. So it's almost like a closed system, um, which certainly doesn't exist at the moment. 
And then lastly, standards and protocols for plastic reduction. Maybe the last fun side, but very, very applicable. If we are reducing our plastic waste, we need a way to measure that, and we need a way for it to be comparable across all industries and companies. So there's a couple of uh, protocols that are in development right now, very similar to the carbon emissions, uh, the greenhouse gas space that we saw, which once that, uh, those standards are adopted and tested by industry, could create the way for plastic offset markets. So that's the business side, and I think how are consumers incentivized, which is all you and I in the room, there's probably three key ways. Education is very effective. So an Australian study identified that actually waste abatement campaigns were more effective than legislative campaigns. And some of the, that makes sense intuitively. If you know what the right thing is to do, then you're going to know when you're doing the wrong thing. And there's that element of peer pressure which helps do that. But if you don't have a national campaign that says, this is what we expect of you, that is a less inbuilt value. Germany is a great example of this. As I said before, they have the highest plastic rec recycling rate in the world. And they reinforce this by having six different colored bins, which are highly accessible over the entire country. Every German knows how to recycle. Every foreigner gets educated. On the financial side, we have both incentives and penalties, um, which I think can be equally effective. So France, for example, is introducing a law where a product without recycled plastic will cost 10% more. If we're thinking about a $1 water bottle, that's actually significant. I guess it's significant across anything. Uh, but there's also the, the pool side, where uh, there's many examples of reverse vending machines where if a consumer drops back their bottle, they get a financial incentive. The example here is Pepsi created basically an online e-coin that you could transfer for many products and services. There are others where gas stations will convert that immediately to uh, fuel discounts, or uh, telecommunication companies will give you free credit, which works really well for sort of um, low-income companies. Smaller deposit scheme. And then there's a creation of behavior change through alternate options. Zero waste grocery stores are, are popping up all over the globe, which really like, train consumers to be active participants in uh, the distribution process. And on the easy side, the UK is installing 200 new public water fountains to encourage bottle refills. They only have 200 at the moment, so they're essentially doubling public access to that resource. So what can you do right now? And I mean, I think this is twofold. This is definitely going to be on the consumer side, but everyone here represents an organization or a business or an educational facility, and everything we just talked about can be applicable there as well. I believe, certainly, in the, the strength of consumer campaigns to tell businesses what the people want, but it's businesses who have to really make that change and, and drive it, or certainly that's where we see the greatest scale. So with that, on the consumer side, you can get your hands dirty. Every September, they have an international coastal cleanup. Bring your colleagues along. They bring their families along. Um, a lot of companies are making this a central part of their corporate responsibility uh, initiatives. You can commit to lasting behavior change. I'm so glad we talked about Loop before. It really is one of the most interesting sort of trials that's coming through. And, I, and I've put the states that are available in, which is all around here. Um, so do do some research on that if it interests you. Uh, and similarly, there's a couple of different initiatives which you can promote to learn more about recycling, eliminating straws, and um, recycling difficult items, particularly with the TerraCycle brand. And then lastly, for those who have kids, you've probably already got a generation of ocean warriors who are, want to know what to do but want some guidance. So there's a great initiative um, happening very soon through the Lonely Whale Foundation, Lonely Whale Foundation that's called the Ocean Heroes Bootcamp. So my last plug will be, or actually I should ask, does anyone know when UN World Oceans Day is each year? Good murmurs. It was last Saturday. So uh, Lonely Whale actually opened up a museum of plastic on Broadway, which will be open till Wednesday. It's a lot of fun, interactive, Instagrammable, so I highly recommend that too. So I know Jamie needs to run away to um, get a plane, but I do have a quick question for you. Um, so about recyclables, uh, is there any movement to create a market since it is so difficult? I mean, to like, if you make it, then you have to sell it. And um, my understanding is that it has been a problem, for example, around New York City. Um, is, is there a market making effort in um, draft? I think there definitely, definitely is. And as you say, it's almost a city and state based issue. 
Um, there's a great NGO called the US Recycling Partnership, or the Recycling Partnership, uh, which is basically helping cities and councils to create more practical uh, recycling facilities for consumers to use. And some of that is simple as creating bins that have lids on them, because the ones that are exposed get exposed to the elements and uh, particularly water, and they can't go through the systems. So that NGO is granting local councils opportunities to change their behaviours and improve the recycling rates in their counties. Um, but there's also some state legislation which is going through which might help with that. And I don't know if anyone is even Coca-Cola, but I, I think in Atlanta they've done a, a big sort of million dollar project as well to improve or to work with the municipalities to improve, improve recycling in that city. Jamie, I won't keep you because I know you have to get a plane. Oh, I'm getting a flight to Singapore for the Alliance. But if you do have any more questions, feel free to um, hit me up on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to answer them. And would everyone join me in thanking Jamie Lee. <laughs>